Eachin, I hope I pronounced that right, Margaret, is from the University of Massachusetts, and she came to us by way of a connection with Tim Campbell. So, Meg, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to you. Thank you so much, and thanks for having me here. Um, I am as was stated, a postdoc currently working at the University of Massachusetts and the uh, USGS, but I come from the University of Minnesota and the Minnesota Aquatic Invasive Species Research Center, so that's some of my background. Um, but now I'm working more generally in the field of uh, fish and wildlife disease and decision making for that. So I'm going to try to give an overview today um, just to give you the sense that uh, fish pathogens are something that should enter into your considerations but also maybe temper some of the fears or panic that you might have about um, certain pathogens coming in um, and try to present the kind of realistic view. So if you have any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them uh, in the chat. So please don't hesitate. All righty, let's get started here. So I know we all think about infectious pathogens maybe a lot just because of the way that COVID has completely changed our lives. But in fact, um, it's not just, it's not just humans that can have pandemics. And in fact, wildlife diseases um, have had population level and even global level impacts on species of concern. The one shown here is one of the more famous examples, the um, chytrid fungus outbreak that was uh, apparently traced back to the ornamental and pet trade spreading and causing declines and even uh, extinctions of certain amphibian species. And this is all to say that pathogens can be particularly problematic and difficult to manage uh, as they can often hide undetected uh, in otherwise innocuous species, but they can also have population level impacts. So while that is all happening on the global stage, I wanna talk a little bit about the context of Wisconsin and the upper Midwest and what you might have to be thinking about here. First of all, I wanna point your attention to places that you can get information about fish pathogens. I think a lot of times folks don't know who the relevant authority is. Um, for the United States, the American Fishery Society Fish Health Section produces what's called the Blue Book, which is a diagnostic manual primarily, but it has tons of information about um, the symptoms of diseases, the sort of epidemiology, their general uh, distribution, all of that stuff is in the um, newly updated Fish Health Section Blue Book, which is entirely available online. The World Animal Health Organization is the International Animal Health and Fish Health Organization, and they produce the Aquatic Animal Health Manual and Aquatic Code, also available entirely online. They're going to have information on, uh, obviously, marine as well as freshwater diseases, and we'll talk a little bit later about um, which of those might be relevant for Wisconsin. But they're sort of the respected authorities at that level. For pathogens that are considered invasive, including uh, macro parasites such as tapeworms, the NOAA Glances database is a good one to look to. It sort of serves as a clearinghouse for other studies. You can also get in touch with uh, veterinary diagnostic labs that will often have a aquatic pathologist or a fish health specialist um, and are typically uh, in charge of the fish health inspectors who will also have some of that frontline knowledge. So I would recommend turning to some of those sources of information. When we think about pathways of spread, I want to highlight just a few of them. Um, it's easy to point the finger to all kinds of human activities, but the fact remains that hydrologic connectivity can be a big vector for disease spread as well. If fish are moving up and down uh, rivers or in and out of chains of lakes, that can be one way. But a lot of these pathogens also have a fairly high survival time in the aquatic environment. Um, and so they simply can float downstream uh, and infect new species. So that's something to remember. I think we kind of forget sometimes. Contaminated equipment is another one. Some states have banned the use of uh, what's shown here, these felt waders, as they could be potentially uh, vectors for spread. But this, of course, is all different kinds of aquatic equipment. Anything that holds water especially uh, could be a source of spread, as I'm sure you're all aware. Live bait fish are another one, and that's where my research has primarily focused. Um, even native species that are otherwise innocuous and unproblematic if released into the water could be hiding uh, hitchhikers, could be hiding invasive or problematic pathogens that uh, are actually living inside the fish and then are able to reproduce and replicate out into the new environment where they're released. So this is a major pathway of concern. The ornamental and pet trade uh, is especially important at the global scale. 
Um, I didn't realize before I started learning about this, but um, on, in the graph on the, on the right here, this is from a Smith et al. paper in um, Science in 2009, 90% of the uh, live animal specimens imported into the United States between 2000 and 2006 were Pisces, were marine and freshwater fish. So there's a huge, huge, huge volume of um, aquatic organisms coming into the country every single day. Uh, and this is obviously a potential pathway for the spread of pathogens. And finally, aquaculture, I wanted to point out here as well. Obviously, um, there are many uh, food fish and bait fish and state-run hatchery programs that have really, really good and excellent biosecurity. Um, but it is a potential risk, of course, right? The risk is never zero. So anytime you're moving fish across the landscape, that's a potential um, pathway for the spread of the pathogens that might be uh, going along with them. So I want to talk a little bit and spend most of the rest of the time thinking about what makes a pathogen of concern. I think this is something that um, when you're facing limited resources, you often have to do a little bit of prioritization work. You, you can't spend all the dollars you want everywhere. So just a few questions I want us to consider um, and I, want, I would ask you to consider when you're thinking about what are the pathogens I'm going to be most concerned about. First, I think it's important to know the national and international context. Sometimes pathogens are of import uh, because they are internationally listed and require a list, uh, a report to the um, either the USDA or some other relevant authority. So that's important to know when you're making these prioritization lists. Obviously, also important is the affected species. Is there an endangered or a threatened species? Is there a unique population that's particularly vulnerable to this? Are there game or sport fish species that are um, particularly vulnerable? That's going to affect who you choose uh, as a priority pathogen. As we just talked about, there's lots of potential pathways. I think it's important to recognize that even though a disease might be of great concern, it might not have any way to get to you, um, and that might warrant it being placed lower on a priority list. Obviously, thinking about the ecological and economic consequences of a disease being introduced are important, and sometimes those can be hard to know, but um, there's a range of potential outcomes that could be evaluated. The prevalence of the pathogen is one I would encourage people to think about. Um, if it's extremely rare and has never been documented in the state, that might be uh, something that is given lower priority than something that is uh, emerging and spreading. And finally, and I think kind of most importantly, what is the ecological and epidemiological history of the pathogen? This is where this question of whether it's invasive or not comes in. You're all invasive species practitioners. You know what it's like when somebody new on the scene appears and starts to wreak havoc. But the fact of the matter is for invasive um, and, and just regular aquatic pathogens, frankly, this, the surveillance is so low and we know so little about the epidemiology of these pathogens that it might already be here and we just simply don't know it. I don't think that's licensed to just do whatever you want, but it is, I think, important to be aware that um, there are a lot of potential, potential players out there that we're just simply not aware of. So being aware of that epidemiological history of the pathogen to the degree that it is known by, uh, by the scientific community is really important in making those decisions. So I wanted to just illustrate how this can play out with the list of reportable fish diseases in Wisconsin. So this is taken from the um, uh, appendix of the Wisconsin uh, documents here. So these are all of the pathogens that uh, are tested for during a fish health inspection on an aquaculture facility, for example. Um, and if you were to detect it in wild fish or in some other context, uh, would have to be reported to the state authority. These are internationally regulated pathogens, so they are likely on this list because they are regulated at that international level. So if you go to the World Animal Health Organization website, you will find information on these. So that's likely why they're on this on this uh, pathway or on this uh, page, I should say. These ones tend to infect salmon species and salmonids are um, obviously prized sport fish, but also important for aquaculture. So they tend to get included on the species uh, and pathogens list. These are the ones that have actually been detected in the United States. So I just want to point out, these ones are the ones that are listed internationally here. These are the ones that are in the United States. So you can see that although it might be listed at the international level, some of these have never even been detected in the continent or even in our country. So I think it's important to recognize that just because it's on a list like this that the regulatory authority has curated 
doesn't automatically translate to a particularly um, worrisome risk for you. There's a few pathogens of fish that are known to potentially um, infect humans. This is one of them. So that's on that list, possibly for that reason. I'm not sure why, but. Uh, and these are a few that can infect live legal bait species. So that's a reason they might be on there. And of all of these listed on the actual regulatory um, list of pathogens, only one viral hemorrhagic septicemia virus is listed on the Wisconsin DNR website. So again, when you're thinking about what pathogens should I be concerned about, I'm an AIS manager and I want to go learn about the most important ones that I need to be aware of. I wouldn't necessarily start with the regulatory lists. The point of this was just to illustrate that these regulatory lists are made for very different priorities than maybe what you're dealing with. So what makes a pathogen actually of concern? There's a couple of things, right? One is this regulatory status. You have to be aware of the ones that you have a legal mandate to report, right? That's, that's in statute. But as an AIS manager or a fisheries manager, you might be interested in impact on sport fish species. You might not have a direct relationship with the aquaculture industry, but you might have some sort of responsibility to uh, protect aquaculture. Your own personal risk attitude is going to play a role as well. If you as a manager and a decision maker have a very risk averse relationship with fish pathogens, you might be interested in a much broader net and a much broader uh, inquiry into the pathogens that could potentially affect you. Well, if you're a little more um, risk tolerant, you might be only interested in the most uh, crisis or critical uh, pathogens that could affect you. One thing I think that drives a lot of uh, what is on the Wisconsin DNR website and other public facing websites is the likelihood that an angler pulls a fish out of the water and freaks out that they have some sort of disease on them and calls you, right? Those ones are the ones that are listed on the website are largely the ones that are gross pathology. So lesions, tumors, bumps, black spots, um, even though most of those pathogens are really, really common and don't present a population level risk to the species, it's something that anglers are going to be engaged in. So they, you might want to know about those as well. Another thing is this level of uncertainty. And this is sort of what I tried to illustrate here in this um, conceptual figure on the right, that for some folks, low uncertainty, um, meaning you have a lot of information about a pathogen, might mean that you're fairly tolerant of that risk. Um, while other times, if there's a lot of unknowns about a pathogen, that might kick it into the high risk category simply on the basis of the precautionary principle. So that is one approach you can take when thinking about these pathogens. So context really matters as well for some of these things. Um, some of you might be familiar with some of the work uh, in invasion ecology on sleeper populations where uh, a pathogen or a, an invasive species that was previously introduced didn't have any impacts for years, maybe up to decades, until some sort of environmental trigger caused it to uh, explode in population and start to have impacts. And that is the exact same thing that can happen with pathogens. There's also, like we said, the acceptable level of risk and your personal risk attitude that's going to drive that decision. There's also, I think, important to consider the synergistic impacts with climate, contaminant, other pathogens, other stressors. Our, our fish and wildlife are under assault from all sides. And even though a pathogen might cause, you know, simple or relatively minor symptoms, added with other stressors and compounded with that could start to build and have a stronger effect. I think it's also important to recognize that risk is both the likelihood and the severity. So when thinking about the risk of an invasive species or the risk of a pathogen, you have to think both about the likelihood that it could get to where you are and start to develop and, and expand in population and the severity of those impacts. Obviously, we're seeing with something like starry stonewort, that likelihood dimension is not really equal across the state. Some areas it seems to be taking off and others it seems to not be. So understanding that those two dimensions are um, separate, I think, is important as well. I think it's also important to consider that while you might only have regulatory or decision-making authority over the fish or wildlife sector, there are potential out-of-sector impacts or benefits to consider, especially as we recognize our um, increasingly interconnected world and have a sort of ecosystem health approach. You might recognize that the potential impacts to the fish and wildlife under your purview are potentially limited, but other, uh, other potential groups, maybe like amphibians or birds 
or um, other other organisms, or even beyond that into the public health sphere, might be potentially impacted by some of these pathogens. So I would just encourage you to think about that as well. So I want to talk about um, this uh, exercise that we went through in Minnesota as part of my PhD work to sort of illustrate the way that we thought about this. This framework is available and could be applied to Wisconsin as well. Um, but just again, to illustrate how we went through identifying uh, what were going to be the pathogens of concern. So as a little bit of background, we did a survey of golden shiners, um, which are a very popular bait species in Minnesota and I'm sure Wisconsin as well. And we purchased them from retail bait shops uh, across the state in 2014 and 2015. We examined the number of fish that were in each lot, as well as the non-target, so non-golden shiner species that were present. All of those ones with the red bracket over here are not golden shiner species that were found mixed in with golden shiners. Um, many of them are still bait species, and that's fine, but a couple of them were non-bait species, uh, and one was even a uh, sport fish, the yellow perch. We also found a number of uh, viruses and bacteria, including some that are included on the Minnesota list of regulated pathogens. What's interesting, though, is that those pathogens are regulated at the level of the sport fish. If they're found in salmonids, uh, it's a reportable disease, but baitfish are not required to be tested for them. So already you see the difference between the list that's regulated and what the actual risk profile in the, in the field could look like. Maybe the bait fish are actually being the vector for something that affects the sport fish. So um, I already kind of talked about this, but um, there's this range from risk tolerant to risk averse, um, and you might fall anywhere along this range, or maybe your agency falls somewhere along this range and you have to carry that out. Um, some people choose the precautionary principle where you just say, anything that I'm uncertain about gets kicked into the high category. Um, unfortunately, with aquatic pathogens, that turns out to be most things we don't have a lot of data on. So we tried to balance the sort of extreme precautionary principle um, with shutting everything down and the other extreme, which is to say, it's all out there anyways, we're gonna do nothing with an evidence-based hazard prioritization, balancing the benefits of live bait use with the risks. And again, this is specific to Minnesota, it's specific to the bait pathway, but the principles could be applied to um, any number of contexts, including um, aquaculture pathway or equipment pathway or pet pathway uh, or other uh, sort of taxonomic groups as well. So I, I did a sort of filtering process where we went from all fish pathogens just to pathogens that can cause disease in Minnesota fish of concern, so sport fish or threatened and endangered fish. Uh, for the purposes of this pathway, we looked at just pathogens that can be transmitted by live bait fish. Um, let me just pause and say, every time I say pathogen, um, it could be a virus, a bacteria, uh, a fungal disease, a, ma a macro or micro parasite. Um, so any of those are going to be included in that group. That gave us a list of 15 potential hazards. Um, hazard is the language, by the way, used in a risk analysis. So every time you see hazard, you can think pathogen uh, or whatever sort of uh, taxonomic group you work with. We then scored these 15 pathogens on seven weighted criteria and ranked them. Uh, the criteria were likelihood of transfer in bait, the prevalence in bait, current distribution in Minnesota, colonization potential, host species, and ecological impact if established, and economic impact if established. And we added up those weighted scores as such. And that gave us these results here. So on the right is this graph again, putting the relationship between risk and uncertainty on the page. Um, and then these are the three pathogens that popped out as most important in our risk analysis. So those were the Asian fish tapeworm, Ovipleostophora ovariae, and viral hemorrhagic septicemia virus. You'll note, however, that there's this cluster right down here um, that includes uh, infectious pancreatic necrosis virus, um, Salmon Aeromonas salmonacida, Yersinia ruckeri, some of these big salmonid pathogens that um, although they didn't make our top three, that was our sort of cutoff, are still important pathogens. So depending on where you drop that risk tolerance line, you might want to look at the top 10 or the top five or something like that. But we, uh, just for the sake of um, sort of uh, limiting our scope, just looked at the top three. So I want to talk about those top three uh, pathogens. I think that um, what's applicable in Minnesota translates fairly well to what's applicable in Wisconsin. But again, it's context dependent. It's dependent on your risk tolerance. 
So don't take this as the sort of definitive answer for what you should be concerned about. This is just what we highlighted in our work. So Ovipleostophora ovariae or OVO is a microsporidian parasite of golden shiners. Um, micro, micro obviously meaning it's very small, but it creates these little tiny like packets of spores that infect the uh, ovary tissue of adult female golden shiners. It's vertically transmitted, meaning it can get on the eggs and infect subsequent generations. And over time with severe infection can actually completely sterilize adult females. The diagnostics for this are typically histopathology such as shown on the right here, uh, or uh, and then confirmed with a qPCR that's available. Um, some diagnostic labs will not do this though. You have to find one that does do this. It's not state regulated in Wisconsin or Minnesota, but it is implicated in risk decisions. Um, if you follow Minnesota politics at all, you know that within the last five years, there have been um, more and more calls to allow import of live bait. We don't currently allow that. And one of the main pathogens that they point to as uh, potentially risky is OVO. Well, in fact, we actually in our lab have found it to be commercially uh, available in uh, Golden Shiners. That study that we did with the 50 bait shops, um, about half of them, we found OVO. So on one level, it's not regulated at the state level, but the DNR is concerned about it potentially being brought in um, with imported live bait. Well, we turn around and we find it's already here. So one of two things is happening. One, people are illegally importing bait that is infected, which is always possible, of course. But two is that it's already here and maybe has been for a long time. So I just wanna point out with this one, although we have these concerns about its impacts, it's possible that it's been here a lot longer than we've been aware of. Um, and uh, risk and sort of regulatory decisions should be made accordingly. Asian fish tapeworm is one that we added um, to our list because of its sort of march across the Great Lakes. Um, it is most commonly known as the Schizocotyl achelonathi, but it also has a lot of other scientific names you might see. It's a cestode parasite, uh, infecting over 200 freshwater fish species and more are added to that list every year. Um, extremely, extremely wide host range, which is one of the reasons it um, is so concerning. It was thought to be introduced to the Great Lakes region um, as early as the 1960s, but that exact history is not known. It is currently listed on the NOAA Glances website as an invasive pathogen. It has horizontal transmission and has a two-stage life cycle, including um, copepods, so it can be extremely difficult to control in um, the wild. Uh, and when it affects the fish, the fish are considered the final host and it causes massive intestinal damage and ultimately kills them. Um, the diagnostic is done with an intestinal smash and confirmed with a PCR. This is also not state regulated in Minnesota or Wisconsin, and it's not even commonly tested for. However, a paper uh, from 2017 shown on the right here uh, out of Michigan State found that um, the prevalence is expanding across uh, the state of Michigan in live bait fish. So all those circles represent uh, bait fish that were sampled from retail stores. And as you can see, some of those are quite close to um, other borders with other states. So uh, again, not known to be in Wisconsin and Minnesota, but we don't test for it. So hard to say whether it's here or not. And finally, the one you've all been waiting for, uh, viral hemorrhagic septicemia virus. Most of you might be aware, but um, it's a wide host range pathogen of um, many Great Lakes species. There's 19 sport fish that are susceptible, especially some of those large charismatic game fish such as muskie and northern pike. The lineage VHSV4B is the one found in the Great Lakes region. Um, it's originally a marine virus that um, somehow made its way to the Great Lakes and is now infecting freshwater species. It causes widespread hemorrhage in the body cavity uh, and in the uh, internal organs. It can survive outside of the host up to a year in cold conditions and actually does most of its damage at low water temperatures, less than 54 degrees. So those cold water uh, settings are where it really takes off. It's not known to be widely distributed in inland lakes. And uh, after 2012 in Wisconsin, it was discovered in the Winnebago Lake system. It's known to be in the Great Lakes, but Thankfully, it did not appear to take off in many inland lakes and cause a bunch of fish kills the way that we were fearing that it would when it first appeared on the scene in the mid-2000s. However, I do want to point this out. This was a paper that came out in 2021 in the Journal of Aquatic Animal Health. And what they did was they went to several lakes in Wisconsin and looked for antibodies to VHS. 
Antibodies are typically representative of a past infection. The fish has recovered from infection and now has uh, neutralizing antibodies, sort of like when you get COVID, you have antibodies afterwards. So they went and tested for these antibodies and found um, in northern pike, walleye, bluegill, uh, and several other species, widespread uh, VHSV resistance, meaning that these fish somehow, somewhere along the line, had been exposed to VHS. These were also all in lakes that had had no previous known outbreaks. So again, I think it's important to note, although we didn't know VHS to be in these lakes, we found that the fish were, um, were already immune to it, uh, highly suggestive of uh, sneak or undetected outbreaks in these lakes in the last several years. So in conclusion, I just wanna say that pathogens are an important group of in parentheses, sometimes invasive species. They might not always be strictly invasive, meaning that they might have been here for a long time, but context can trigger uh, outbreaks and concerning impacts on fish. Prioritizing pathogens is an art and not a science. There's no definitive right answer, and it's gonna depend a lot on what you have the regula regulatory authority to do, as well as your own risk tolerance. Context matters. It matters what fish are going to be infected. It's going to matter whether they've been exposed or not. It's going to matter whether the environmental conditions are right for that pathogen to take off and have impacts. Uh, as evidenced by the VHS discovery, the absence of evidence is not evident, is not absent, sorry, I should say is not evidence of absence, meaning that um, just because we don't know it's there doesn't mean it's not there. And risk-informed outbreak and mortality event investigation is an excellent and very important monitoring tool. So if you're having fish kills happening, if you're having um, outbreaks of disease happening, getting those tested and understanding what the factors are there is really important. So with that, I'd be happy to take questions um, and you can reach me at my email or my Twitter handle there and I'll drop those in the chat as well. Thank you. Thanks, Meg. That was a lot of great information. This is not something we hear about a lot. Um, and so it, it